my training is in science, uh, but more recently I've been very interested in understanding the contributions that the ancient Indians had uh, towards the scientific di disciplines. And I've been, through my readings, I've been rather astonished to see these uh, contrib some astounding contributions that the ancient Indians have done. Uh, and uh, somewhat uh, disappointed, or let's say disheartened, that I wasn't introduced to some of this uh, in my school curriculum as a, uh, as a student. So I'm going to go to the next slide here. I'd like to uh, begin by giving some quotations from the foundations of Indian culture. So we understand the viewpoints of Sri and what he thought about the contributions of India uh, towards some of these scientific disciplines. So he says, uh, to say that Indian philosophy has led away from the study of nature is to state a gross unfact and to ignore the magnificent history of Indian culture. If by nature is meant physical nature, the plain truth is that no nation before the modern epoch carried scientific research so far which, with such signal success as India of ancient times. Not only was India in the first rank in mathematics, astronomy, chemistry, medicine, surgery, all of the branches of physical knowledge which were practiced in ancient times, but she was, along with the Greeks, the teacher of the Arabs from whom Europe recovered the lost habit of scientific inquiry and got the basis from which modern science started. So in this next slide, I'm going to share with you the history of the world GDP from the first century to 2008. This was published in The Economist. Uh, the pink uh, in the first century, the pink uh, color here shows the uh, contribution of uh, India to the, to the GDP of the world. It's roughly about uh, 33 percent, 33 to 35 percent. Uh, it leads the world in the first century, followed by China. Now, if you go 1,500 years later, uh, that's about the time the Europeans had just about discovered the route to India. The GDP of uh, India has fallen a little bit. It's around 23 to 25%. And uh, after uh, around the time the British leave, which is the 1940s, you see that uh, the GDP has India has dropped, and it's only a few percentage. And uh, now we are slowly limping back up. So if you look at this chart, you realize that ancient India, and to some extent medieval India as well, was a wealthy nation. Uh, in fact, uh, there's a uh, uh, quote here from uh, Pliny, the Roman writer, who says, not a year passed when India did not take 50 million sestres away from Rome. And what he means is India was exporting a lot of goods, uh, processed goods, and uh, there was a demand for these goods all over the world. Uh, we were leading in production of textiles, in uh, metals, medicine. Uh, also, we were uh, making crystallized sugar, for instance, which was a hot commodity elsewhere. Uh, the Indians had figured out how to crystallize uh, sh sugar from the mother liquor, and uh, that was very popular. Uh, pro it was a popular product. We also had, of course, other agricultural products that included spices. So India was able to make all these advanced uh, or rather unique uh, products that were much wanted elsewhere. It's because it had a strong uh, foundation in some of the science and technology. For instance, it had done a lot of advances in chemistry and medicine, water management, uh, agricultural sciences, architectural sciences, mathematics, astronomy. Uh, in this talk, it's uh, uh, it's just too little time to discuss all of these topics, so I'm going to focus on just metallurgy, mathematics, uh, Ayurveda, with a focus on, uh, on the surgeon Shushruta. So uh, studying uh, advances in metallurgy. Metallurgy refers to the study of metals, as you would have uh, guessed. Uh, the history of metals is uh, often studied by historians because it is closely linked 
to the history of development of the human civilization. Um, it gives you a window by studying the materials that people use. It gives you a window into uh, the technological progress a civilization has made. Uh, all civilizations start with the Stone Age, uh, and uh, then the stone. There's only so much you can do with stone. This is followed by the age of uh, the discovery of metals. Uh, most civilizations have discovered uh, have started with copper as uh, the metal uh, as the first metal because it's uh, readily it's available it can be available in its native state and you can pretty much use as use it as is uh, you don't have to do any purification to it uh, but the problem with copper is it's a very soft metal and so you have now uh, to harden it so they discovered that you could harden it by the addition of other impurities such as uh, uh, zinc or tin and that results in the formation of bronze and gives rise to the Bronze Age. Bronze, uh, with bronze you can make weapons. Uh, but uh, after this comes the Iron Age and iron is requires more sophisticated technology uh, to extract out and iron is harder than bronze and it makes, uh, 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 it can be used for weapons along with uh, of course tools. Now, after iron comes the steel age. Uh, steel is a uh, very similar to iron, except that it has uh, carbon as an impurity, and that gives it a lot of strength. And the, uh, the steel age is uh, dated here as 0 AD, and that really refers to the age when the uh, Indians had discovered steel. It, uh, the uh, Europeans really discovered steel much later on in the 18th century. 1950s uh, is the silicon age where silicon uh, chips, uh, semiconductors were discovered and those were being used uh, in, the, in computers and that brought about the uh, advent of the information age. And currently we live in the carbon age, uh, which is we are using different materials made out of carbon. Uh, for instance, the touch screen on your computers and uh, cell phones is made out of a material of, uh, called graphene, which is a type of carbon. So I'd like to highlight the Steel Age. Uh, the Steel Age is a very important age. It marks a huge, uh, uh, a, a, a big shift in the human civilization. Steel is, like I mentioned, a very a tough material. And without steel, without the invention of steel, you wouldn't have these huge high skyscrapers. Uh, you wouldn't have these uh, huge suspension bridges. Or as a matter of fact, you wouldn't have even uh, rail transportation uh, without uh, the invention of steel. And once steel was, you could say, rediscovered by the Europeans uh, in the 19th century, and they figured out how to make steel at, ve at very large scale, that is what uh, uh, helped in the advent of the Industrial Revolution. Now, I'm going to go directly to the iron and steel technology in India. Uh, because uh, they were very advanced. Uh, of course, they had many contributions in the Bronze Age as well, but I'll start with the, uh, the iron technology. It was very advanced. As you can see on the picture on the left, you have the rust-free iron pillar, which was made sometime during the Gupta period, about the fourth century. And rust, uh, you, we all know that iron tends to rust uh, over age, and it's been close to 2,000 years, and it has been uh, rust-free so far. On the uh, contrary, you have the Eiffel Tower uh, in Paris, built in 1889. It is painted every seven years to prevent rusting, and it needs close to 60 tons of paint. Uh, in this slide, I'm showing you the uh, uh, steel technology from uh, made. Uh, it, it refers to the. It shows these Damascus steel swords that was made from the Indian wood steel. Uh, Damascus uh, steel swords were, were fashioned in Damascus, Syria, but they were using the steel from, made from India. Most of the steel was coming from South India. Uh, the original name for steel is Uruku in Tamil, which gets distorted to Uku and then Wuk, and the Europeans end up calling it Woods. Now, the, st uh, the, the steel uh, swords uh, are legendary. They were used in the, they were much favored by the Arabs uh, during the used and they were used during the Battle of the uh, during Crusades. Uh, they were so sharp uh, that you could actually have a soft material like a silk handkerchief fall on the 
edge of the blade and it would be able to cleave that soft material. They even fashioned a word, uh, the Arabs fashioned a word called jawab e hind which means they could actually, uh, it, it meant a, re a befitting response uh, with the Indian blade, uh, which meant, uh, you know, slashing, beheading the head of the enemy. Now the uh, steel looks, has the inset here shows the wavy nature of the steel uh, uh, when under close examination and, and it, uh, it had this watery mark that was very typical of the steel coming from India. You had industrial steel production of steel. Uh, there are in 1600s, there are accounts of almost uh, 20,000 pounds of steel being shipped in just one single shipment uh, from Golkar and Andhra Pradesh to Persia. There were other such historical accounts by Dutch uh, sailors as well about steel being exported from India. Uh, I'd like to now talk about some of the references that show that, there were, uh, that India was in fact producing uh, or was one of the original producers of, of steel. Uh, there is the book Periplus of the Eritrean Sea from the first century AD, which mentions uh, ferrum indicum among the list of articles subjected to duty at Alexandria. There's a, a historian, Quintus Curtius Rufus, from the first century, who records a gift which was given to the victorious invader Alexander. He was given a hundred talents of Indian steel. Uh, there was the Alexandrian alchemist uh, Zosimos from the 3rd century who actually describes how steel was being made in crucibles. And you have Muhammad al-Idrisi from the 12th century who says the Hindus excelled in the manufacture of iron and it is impossible to find anything to surpass the edge from the Hinduani or Indian steel. So why is uh, discovery of steel so crucial? I mentioned it earlier. Uh, I'll mention it again. It's because of its uh, because of the mechanical strength of the steel. The table here is given here, uh, giving the uh, the various uh, uh, strengths of different materials, including steel in megapascal. And if you go down the table, there's a number for the work hardened steel, which is almost. Uh, eight times more than pure copper and about four times more than bronze. Now, as I mentioned earlier, steel is nothing but 99% iron with a little bit of carbon added to it. And this carbon is what gives it the uh, incredible strength. Now, there are different uh, classifications of the iron carbon alloys in modern day based on the extent of carbon content. Uh, so you have the wrought iron. This is the iron that you see in your fences, in your windows, in your window grills. It contains carbon content uh, less than 0.25%. And it's highly bendable, uh, but not as strong. Then comes the steel, uh, which is the steel that is used for making the swords or the armors. The carbon content is a little more than wrought iron, between 0.25 to 2%. It's uh, less bendable, but stronger than wrought iron. And then you have cast iron. The carbon content is about 2 to 4%. It's uh, much stronger than steel, but brittle. So it can break easily. The cast iron pans in your homes are made of uh, this material. Now, the uh, you can see just a small variation in the carbon. Anywhere from 0.25% to 4% is making a huge uh, uh, difference in the way, uh, in the nature of the of the material, the strength of the material. So just a small variation in the carbon content. Now it turns out this modern classification is also there in the uh, ancient text called Rasaratna Samukaya. It's a text from the 8th to the 10th century CE. Uh, they also classify the different carbon iron carbon alloys. Uh, there's the kantaloha or the soft iron, which they, which you can relate to as the wrought iron. And this is further divided into five classifications based on the mag magnetic properties of the iron. Then you have tikshanaloha, which is the steel, and it's further classified into the different uh, uh, groups based on the cutting edge, the, on how sharp uh, the cutting edge is. Then you have cast iron, uh, which is uh, the mundaloha further classified into three types. So this extensive classification that the ancient Indians had done would suggest that they had a very good methodology on how to make each of these different 
types of materials and uh, also uh, most likely the method was reproducible so that would be uh, a takeaway from this now the uh, iron was being uh, made uh, was being smelted uh, or being extracted from the iron ore in these big furnaces uh, here's a cartoon of a megalithic furnace that was made in Nikon Maharashtra that was discovered in Nikon Maharashtra in the it corresponds to the 4th to the 6th century BCE these were conically shaped and you would have be having the iron ore along with the charcoal that would burn to temperatures of about 1200 degrees centigrade you had these nozzles through which the air would be introduced uh, to achieve hi these high temperatures and um, the essentially you would uh, end up with a lot of impurities that would uh, as liquid come out at the at the end of the furnace So here's a quick idea of how wood the steel was being made in India. What's what I mentioned as was called as the wood steel. So you would start with iron ore. You would uh, reduce it with uh, charcoal, uh, and uh, you would end up with iron. It was a direct reduction reaction, and you would end up with a product known as bloomery iron. So it had the spongy sort of look, and you would hammer out these impurities when it was red hot to obtain the what's known as wrought iron this wrought iron you would then heat in little vessels known as crucibles which would go these uh, small vessels were made of uh, ceramic and they could go to temperatures of about 1500 which is roughly close to the melting point of iron so the wrought iron would melt uh, and there would be and it would dissolve some of the carbon from the charcoal and uh, you would end up with wood steel So now I am uh, showing you a slide uh, which uh, shows the crucibles steel was being made in ancient India in 300 BC. There's a little shloka on, uh, on, on, on the crucibles. Now, Europe was making very inferior quality uh, steel. Uh, and uh, they had no idea on how to uh, get to that high quality steel. In fact, uh, there was a clockmaker called Benjamin Huntsman from 1740 who got tired of not getting good quality steel that he decided to go ahead and invent some of it himself and uh, he supposedly invented this uh, crucible steel making process to get high quality steel there is not much known about this person he was very secretive he did not share any of his work uh, he didn't patent any of his methods and uh, there is, however, a little write-up on him in the prestigious uh, Nature magazine from 1944, which says that cast steel made it. Uh, I'm just reading the quote here from the article. It says, cast steel made in a crucible heated in a charcoal fire supplied with a forced draught in a, is an invention of unknown antiquity. It was known as wood steel and was exported from, from southern India to Damascus, where it was called Damascus steel. It was uh, this uh, steel Huntsman set himself uh, to imitate. So you can clearly see from this writing that Huntsman knew about uh, the methods that were being used by the Indians and he was essentially imitating it. There are uh, several scientific papers uh, in Europe that were published in the 19th century that shows that wood steel was being uh, really uh, analyzed it was like this gold standard that they were trying to imitate you had uh, Mouche who uh, did some experiments here on woods or Indian steel he published his paper in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society in 1804 you have Michael Faraday who was actually the inventor of the electrochemical cell he, he was actually also analyzing woods or Indian steel uh, a special mention goes to Briant. He did almost close to a hundred experiments, and he uh, very systematic experiments. We very added different elements to the iron and figured out that it was carbon that was making uh, the giving the steel its uh, strong its property of strength. 
So a general conclusion from several of these publications in Europe was that wood steel was uh, superior to European steel, and its uh, strength was from alloying with carbon around uh, 1.3 to 2 percent. Eventually, Bessemer make steel making process uh, was invented by Henry Bessemer in 1855, and that drives uh, the Industrial Revolution in the West. Uh, and I'd like to quickly give you some information on the production of zinc, which was also unique to India. Uh, zinc extraction in India was uh, almost three centuries earlier than China. China had a slightly different way of uh, extracting zinc. Uh, extraction of zinc uh, has created a huge problem was a huge problem because it vaporizes around 900 degrees, which is centigrade, which is close to the temperature where the ore also smells. And so what happens is the zinc comes out as a vapor and reacts with the oxygen in the air, and you make uh, zinc oxide, and it's not pure anymore. So it's hard to trap this vapor. So the ancient Indians came up with a breakthrough technology using the, uh, what's known as downward distillation. So they would take a pot. Uh, which had uh, which would be full of ore, and then they would essentially invert the spot, so it was its mouth was facing downwards. The inverted pot would be surrounded with uh, uh, charcoal and burnt, so the ore would smelt and zinc would come out as vapor, and as as a way in vapor form, it would meet this cooling chamber. Uh, and it would cool, which was placed just at the mouth where the uh, where the uh, inverted pot was, uh, where the mouth of the inverted pot was facing downwards, and you would end up with uh, zinc uh, uh, vapor solidifying in, into uh, zinc metal. So zinc was uh, uh, used uh, to make, uh, if most of you may know, the zinc uh, use, is used to make brass. So zinc added to uh, copper makes brass. Now, mercury was also extracted by a similar process of downward distillation, and I'm not going to any details of this. Uh, there are uh, there's a paper by P. T. Craddock uh, which was published uh, that shows that uh, he was actually looking to date some of these uh, ancient mines in India. Uh, for instance, the Zawar mines in Rajasthan, which are still active today, uh, were the 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 activity the mining activity here, he was able to date it to 500 BCE. There was also uh, uh, some artifacts that they discovered from, from more from the 12th to the 14th century. We, these are actually parts of the furnace uh, with uh, these upside down pots which can contain the zinc ore, etc. Now, zinc extraction was uh, uh, very uh, unique, as I said, to India and China, and the Europeans were importing a lot of the zinc to make brass. Uh, now, this was really uh, uh, not such a good idea for England because they were spending a lot of money on zinc, on zinc, buying zinc from elsewhere. So they decided to pursue and understand how to be able to extract zinc. And it turns out this person called William Champion, his father was in the, he had investment in the brass industry. He uh, goes around, he has some uh, metallurgy experience, unlike William Huntsman, who uh, who was making the, who made, ended up uh, making this crucible steel. Uh, so he actually uh, comes up with a method which is exactly similar to the downward distillation. It is possible uh, he was influenced by India, though we will not know uh, for sure if that was the case. And he patents the method in 1738. So a quick summary, uh, best quality steel was invented in India and was being produced since 300 BCE. There are many evidences of steel being exported either directly or through Arabia to Europe. Uh, Damascus steel swords were made using Indian steel, like I showed you. Uh, wood steel uh, from India was experimented on. It was like this gold standard that 18th century Europe used and figured out that the carbon at, in the concentration of 1 to 2 percent was responsible for imparting toughness to the steel. And zinc manufacturing in 18th century England was identical to the zinc manufacturing in India from, the th from 300 BC. So hopefully you can see uh, the advanced uh, 
uh, metallurgy that was happening in India compared to uh, Europe. So I'd like to now switch gears and talk to you about mathematics in ancient and medieval India. Mathematics was given a, a, a prominent place among uh, the sciences. Uh, here's a quote from the Vedanga Jyotishya. It says, like the crests on the head of peacock, like the gems on the hoods of the cobras, mathematics is at the top of the Vedanga Shastras. The biggest invention that has come out of India has been the invention of the decimal system. It is now uh, well accepted that the origin of this is the, uh, of the so-called Arab numer numerals is from India. Uh, we, we all know now that uh, you with just nine numbers and zero, you're able to generate any, any number up to infinity. So uh, here's a, a, line, a quote from the Yoga Sutra which explains the, the, uh, the position of uh, the various uh, numbers. From, it's from the 5th century CE. It says, just as a line in the hundredths place, a hundred, in the tenths place, ten, and one in the ones place, so one and the same woman is called mother, daughter, and sister. Now, there are many cultures that claim to have invented zero, uh, but the oldest record of zero ex is coming from India. Uh, it's in the Bakshali manuscript that's dated to about third century. Uh, there's also a uh, inscription in the Chaturbhuj temple from Gwalior, Madhya Pradesh, uh, where zero is uh, observed, and it comes from a later date, uh, about the ninth century AD. Now. Uh, Often it is said that it's the, f the science is driven by the philosophy yeah, in a civilization. And the Indians were always contemplating about shunya or void or nothingness. And therefore, um, it is not very surprising that they came up with this number zero in, uh, in the number system. Now, uh, unlike other cultures who may have also invented zero, like the Mayans and the Chinese also claim that. Uh, a zero was not just a placeholder. It was actually, there were specific rules given by, uh, the first person to give specific rules on how to operate with zero was Brahmagupta from the 6th century. Uh, he actually uh, explained how you could, uh, what would happen if you were to multiply, add, subtract with zero. Uh, he actually also came up with negative numbers and uh, explain them uh, with uh, using the concept of uh, debts and fortunes. So uh, zero eventually reaches Europe through Arabs. Uh, however, in Europe, in the Middle Ages, they called it the devil number, and they outlawed it. So I do want to emphasize the point again that it's the science that uh, the science is driven by the philosophy. And if zero was not invented, you would not have the binomial, the binary systems that you use to code computers. The Europeans were not very, uh, you know, excited with negative numbers either. It says here that uh, in 1758, the, I'm quoting here a British mathematician, Francis Maceres, and this is what he said on negative numbers. He says, they darken the very whole doctrines of the equations and make dark of the things which are in their nature excessively obvious and simple. It was only in the 19th century that European mathematicians really started to play with negative numbers and uh, use them. So while the Indians were using this decimal system and counting in the decimal system, what were the uh, Europeans doing? So they were using the Roman numerals pretty much right up to the 2000 AD. So Roman numerals, uh, as some of you may remember or recall from middle school, uh, they have specific letters for specific numbers. So one is, got, uh, re is denoted by an I. You have 10 denoted with X, 100 as C, M as 1000. So you can see that there is a, uh, you have to remember, as a user, you will have to remember the different letters that correspond to the different numbers. Uh, not the most intuitive way of counting. 
um, uh, if you if you recall, five is written as we, and then four is if you put an i before we, then it's five. Uh, five minus one is four. If you have a i after five, then it's five plus one, which gives six. So the nightmare of operating, uh, of not just writing but operating huge numbers, uh, is quite unthinkable with Roman numerals. It was actually the Italian mathematician Fibonacci who wrote a book called Liber Abaci in 1202. He was in love with the Hindu way of counting and he introduced the Hindu numeral system as the modus indorum or method of Indians to Europe. And he in fact popularized uh, this way of the decimal system in Europe. Now, uh, the Indians were great astronomers, so they were also fascinated by large numbers, which is where it's in astronomy you're most likely to use large numbers. They had names for each of these large numbers. Uh, Laksha is 10 to the power of 5, Koti is 10 to the power of 7. I have a list here going right up to 10 to the 91, and I haven't, there's numbers even bigger than this. Uh, the highest number the Greeks had conceptualized was a myriad, and that corresponds to about uh, 10,000. Now, uh, the, the Indi ancient Indians never separated uh, mathematics from uh, poetry or music. They, all, they saw it always in a holistic way. They saw... Uh, uh, they were writing everything in poetry. Uh, they were writing the science in poetry, the mathematics in poetry, uh, and uh, all the texts, uh, are, many of the texts, uh, Sanskrit texts, religious texts are also in poetry. And they had a lot of rhythm in this poetry. Uh, we all understand of rhythm in music, but rhythm in poetry is something they also used. This is because they observed rhythm in in all movements in this world. Uh, you your heartbeat has a rhythm, the seasons have a rhythm, the waves, the breathing, the rotation of the earth. So this rhythm, uh, I unfortunately am not able to play this video for you, but it's a short uh, poem by Adi Shankaracharya called Bhavani Ashtakam, and maybe many of you know it. Uh, and uh, it has a lot of rhythm in it, and it is actually um, set to, uh, I'll go into a little more detail in the next couple of slides on this particular poem. So how does one introduce rhythm in poetry? You do this by using short and long syllables. Uh, you, you have a pattern of short and long syllables. So short or lagu and long or guru. So for instance, a short syllable like a, uh, uh, if you express it as a long syllable, it will become a, uh, e. E, e is a short syllable, E is a long syllable. U is a short syllable, U is a long syllable. So this uh, using of pattern of stressed and unstressed syllables or short or long syllables is also used in the English meter. So in this uh, Brujanga Prayat, uh, uh, with the Bhavani Ashtakam that you would have heard, uh, that some of you may know, it goes like this. It says, na tato, na mata, na bandhur, na data, na putro, na putri, na bhrityo, na bhrata. And it is set to the rhythmic movement of a snake. The uh, snake is supposed to go with the one short slither and two long slithers. Okay? So short, long, long. Uh, and so na ta to na is short, ta is long, to is long. Na again is short, ma ta long long. Na pandhur so short long long. So it's short long long short long long short long long. Uh, Twelve of these together make the bhujanga prayat. Twelve in a meter. Now, there was uh, poets like Pingala who were studying the prosodic meters or the poetic meters. Uh, he was studying, he's from, the two, from 200 BCE, and he was actually uh, both a poet and a mathematician. And one of his questions was, how many meters can you get based on a given number of syllables? Uh, by the way, the, the study of poetic meter is known as Chanda Shastra. So he said, if I if I have if I use one syllable, what what kind of combinations am I going to get? I can get either a short, 
or I can get a long meter syllable. If I use two syllables, I can get a meter which is either short short or short long or long short or long long. If, I, if you have three syllables, so basically you can get four patterns out of two syllables. If I have three syllables, you can get short short short, short short long, short long short, long short short, etc. and you will come up with eight patterns. So if you tabulate this, for one syllable you will get two combinations, for two syllables you are going to get four combinations which is 2 to the power of 2, for three syllables you are going to get eight combinations uh, which is 2 to the power of 3, four syllables you have to get 16 combinations which is 2 to the power of 4. So based on this pattern Pingala said you have n syllables you are going to get 2 to the power of n possible meters. So he actually graphically represented it uh, as a uh, triangle, he called it the Meru Prastara or the staircase of Mount Meru, uh, I am not going into any detail on how it was constructed, it is really quite easy to make. And with this graphical triangle, uh, a poet can easily figure out how many patterns he can get by using a certain amount of syllables. So if you are starting with one syllable, you go to the first row and you add the numbers on the first row, 1 plus 1, you are going to get 2 patterns or 2 to the power of 1. If you have 2 syllables, you add the numbers in the second row which is 1 plus 2 plus 1 which is 4 patterns which is 2 to the power of 2, uh, exactly what you saw in the tabular form, 3 syllables is 1 plus 3 plus 3 plus 1 which is 8 patterns, so 2 to the power of 3, etc. So, uh, this triangle currently is known as the Pascal Triangle. This is how children in all over the world learn it as the Pascal Triangle. It has got some very interesting uh, number patterns hidden in it, which obviously I'm not, for lack of time, I'm not going to go into. Uh, it's used for solving binom binomial equations. Now, if you look at the timeline of how Meru Prastara got uh, called the Pascal Triangle, uh, Hala Yuda in 975 CE, he describes uh, a Sanskrit text on how to construct the Meru Prastara and refers to Pingala as the originator of it. So this is how you know that Pingala was the one in 200 BC that actually made the Meru Prastara. Uh, Al Kharaji, a Persian mathematician from the 10th century describes this the triangle. We do know that the Persians uh, were uh, strongly, uh, they, were, they loved Indian mathematics and they were actually uh, following a lot of this and translating a lot of the Hindu texts into Arabic and Persian. Uh, you have uh, the Chinese mathematician who describes this triangle in 1303. And finally, you have uh, Pascal in 1650 who is credited with the discovery of the triangle uh, even though he discovers this 800 years later. So now I would like to uh, talk about Virahanka and Hema Chandra who were also studying prosodic meters but they were actually uh, studying them based on duration. Uh, Virahanka was from the 6th and 7th century. He was actually uh, counting, meet he was counting meters by fixed syllables, not by fixed syllables rather but counting by duration of beats. So uh, he assigned the short or lagu as one beat and the long or guru as two beats. So if you do that and uh, you try to understand the pattern, so let us start with the duration of one beat, you get a short syllable because it is worth one beat, you cannot get a long because that would be worth two beats. So you can only get one pattern if you set the duration at one beat. If you have a duration of two beats, you are going to get short short and a long, so you get two patterns because one plus one is two and the long is worth two beats. Uh, duration of 3 beats, you are going to get 1 plus 1 plus 1 which is short, short, short and you can get a short long which is 1 plus 2 or 2 plus 1. So you get 3 patterns. If you look at duration of 4 beats, you are going to end up with uh, five, pat uh, 5 types of combination. So if you list this in tabular form once again, you uh, you come up with this list and then let us, if you were to lay it out, uh, in, a, in a series, you will find an interesting pattern in these numbers. So if you start with 0 and 1, the, sec the number following that is usually an addition of the two preceding numbers. 
So the number three, one here is an addition of zero plus one, which is one. The next number will be an addition of the two numbers preceding it, one plus one, which is two. Uh, three, which is an addition of two plus one. Five, which is an, which is an addition of three plus two, etc. So this above series is known as the Fibonacci series, uh, named after the Italian Fibonacci, even though it was discovered by Virenka uh, first and followed by commentaries uh, by Hema Chandra. Now, some people even say that this pattern is found in Meru Prasthara, so it is actually discovered by Pingala in 200 BC. So, if you were to now again lay the timeline for how these numbers were called as Fibonacci numbers, uh, let's start with Virahanka, who actually first talked about them uh, in uh, as duration. He was looking at prosodic meters as duration of beats. And he did this work in 500 CE. Uh, Gopala wrote these numbers uh, in 1135. He referred to them. But Gopala was actually, there's not much known about Gopala, so therefore I have this blank here. Then Hema Chandra talked about this in 1150 CE. And finally, you have the Italian mathematician who refers to this series as the Indian series in his book, uh, Liberibachi. Uh, so he himself did not take credit for these series. It was actually the Europeans after him who started calling it the Fibonacci series. Now, what's very interesting about these numbers is they apply not only to poetry, but they are applicable in nature as well. So uh, if you look at flowers in nature, you will often find the number of petals associated with a flower is, e uh, is equal to the number found in, in, this, uh, in the series for, for, I'm going to call it the Virahanka Hema Chandra Fibonacci series or VHF series. Uh, so you have one now a flower here for one, with one petal, two, three. You normally won't find flowers with four petals. That's a rarity. You, do f you must have heard of four-leafed clovers for luck. Those are very rare rarities, almost like mutations in the flower. You have uh, five-leafed uh, hibiscus here, five-petaled hibiscus here. Uh, you will find eight uh, petal flowers. You won't find nine. Often you won't find nine, 10, 11, but then you'll have uh, daisies uh, with 13 petals, etc. So uh, it's not always the rule that you're only going to find Fibonacci uh, uh, petals uh, with the number in, uh, in, the, in these VHF series. Uh, there are times, of course, this rule is broken. But by and large, you will find flowers with the numbers of petals similar to the, uh, that are found in the VHF series. You also find these in fruits and vegetables. The most famous ones are these spirals. Uh, in the in pine cones, if you count them, they add up to the numbers seen in the uh, VHF series. The same with spirals in uh, in the sunflower seed head. Uh, now I'm going to go to geometry. The contributions that the Indians made in the field of geometry. This is uh, uh, quite interesting. Uh, they were doing a lot, as you know, of Vedic, they were making a lot of Vedic fire altars. And these uh, fire altars have geometric shapes of circles, squares, and rectangles. And uh, they're used for uh, ceremonies and rituals. And so a lot of the geometric geometry is, is written up in these uh, short sutras in, found in the Shulva Sutras. There are four main Shulva Sutras, the Baudhayana Shulva Sutra, uh, which is dated to about 800 to 500 BCE. You have the Manava Shulva Sutra, Shulva Sutra, Apastamba, and the Katyayana Shulva Sutra. There are other sh uh, Shulva Sutras also, but they are not as uh, popular as these ones. Uh, like I mentioned, the priest uh, uses these geometrically shaped altars, like squares or semicircles and rectangular altars. Now, there are constraints on these geometric shapes. These altars all have to have the same area. So uh, this would mean you would have to understand uh, these geometric sh sh uh, shapes quite well and be able to uh, make uh, the, same, the areas to be the same between these geometric figures. 
they also had uh, complex shapes uh, besides these simple geometric shapes. For instance, the falcon fire altar. You had the uh, also the chakra, the wheel fire, uh, the wheel fire altar. You have the tortoise shaped fire altar. So you can imagine the amount of geometry that they had to understand to be able to cre create these altars. Uh, most of us in uh, school have learned the Pythagorean theorem. Uh, it refers to this uh, right angle triangle, the properties of a right angle triangle. And what uh, it states is that in any right angle triangle, the, hypo the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the square of the sum of the two sides. Now, Baudhayana, he actually developed this uh, rule uh, almost 300 years before Pythagoras, and it's, no, and it's written up in the Baudhayana Shulava Sutra. I will explain it simply. What he says is, if you have a right angle triangle and you have a square, you make a square on, one, on the two sides of this right angle triangle. So if you make a square using A as one of the sides and a square using B as one of the sides, then the hypotenuse, uh, the square on the hypotenuse will be equal to the sum of the, of the areas of the two squares. So he explained it slightly differently. He gave it more of an area calculation. But the result was pretty much the same as the Pythagorean theorem. Now, uh, other cultures also, such as the Egyptians, the Chinese, and Babylonians, uh, also there are, there are indications that they also developed this third theorem much earlier than Pythagoras as well. So uh, the question is, why is it called Pythagoras? Uh, why is it called Pythagoras theorem? And uh, there's, a, there's a cult following of Pythagoras, which was, there was cult following was there even when he was alive. And now, uh, even, even when he's dead. Uh, the Pythagoras theorem, here's a, a little uh, snippet from a textbook uh, printed in the US. It says, the Pythagorean theorem is named for the Greek philosopher Pythagoras because he was the first person known to have proved it deductively. However, the theorem was known to many ancient cultures and has been used for at least a 1,000 years before the time of Pythagoras. These ancient cultures probably never bothered to prove it. Instead, they simply noticed that it was true every time they tested it and that it was very useful in art, architecture, and construction. Now, that is uh, quite far from the truth. Pythagoras did not give a proof for the theorem. In fact, the proof for the theorem was given in the elements by Euclid 300 years later, and he nowhere attributes the proofs to Pythagoras. So it sort of begs the question, why exactly is this theorem called Pythagoras if he was not given the proof, he had never given the proof for it, and if there were ancient cultures that had come up with this well, well before Pythagoras. Now, if you keep playing around with the Pythagorean theorem, you will end up with discovery of irrational numbers. Uh, irrational numbers, uh, as many of you may know, are numbers that can never be expressed as a fraction. And if you do express them as a decimal, uh, they will go on forever. So uh, here's an example of a right angle triangle. The sides of the, of the right angle triangle are of unit size each. So the hypotenuse will have a dimension of square root of 2, because it's 1 square plus 1 squared, which is 2. And hypotenuse squared will be, hypotenuse will be root 2. So this number, read through square root of 2, is an irrational number. And if you try to express it as a decimal, here is uh, an example of this. I've written these numbers right up to, uh, uh, written, one point, uh, written the decimal value of square root of 2 up to the 500 decimal place here, roughly there. So it goes on as 1.4142135162, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and goes on to infinity. And uh, you really cannot express it. Uh, as a fraction. So the it's a bit like the number pi. Pi is another irrational number. So uh, there's a story, uh, maybe a legend, that a Greek called Hippasus who was drowned for showing the existence of irrational numbers. So the Greeks really did not like irrational numbers. Now it's uh, interesting on how the Indians went about trying to find out the 
the value for square root of 2. This is given, this procedure is given in the Shilva Sutras. Uh, they actually state in the Shilva Sutra the value of square root of 2 to the accuracy of the sixth decimal place. So they state that uh, square root of 2, they give the, uh, the text actually describes this. It says square root of 2 is nearly equal to 1.1 over 3 plus 1 over 4 times 1 over 3 minus 1 over 34 times 1 over 4 times 1 over 3. And if you solve this equation, you get a value of 1.414213. So how exactly did they come up with this equation? And uh, get to an accuracy to the sixth decimal place. So as I mentioned, they were excellent in geometry. So most likely they solved this problem geometrically by starting with two identical squares. And uh, these identical squares, each one of them had an area of one. So you generate a third square, which is a combination of these two areas. Uh, and that would be one. So the combined area of that third square, which is a combination of these two squares, would have an area of two. And so uh, if you know, and the dimension of that square, uh, which has an area of 2, would be square root of 2. So if you know the dimension of that third square, dimension of the side of that third square, you would come up with uh, the value for square root of 2. So I'll try to show this uh, uh, in, in animation form. So uh, you start with two squares. You divide, the, you divide the second square, which is the red square, into three parts. Now you uh, combine these two squares by starting with the blue square, which has a side with the dimension of 1. Now you basically take one of the parts of the second square, red square. The dimension of that rectangle is 1 third. You place it along the side of the previous blue square. Then you place the second part on top. Now you still have uh, on top of the first square. Now you still have a third part remaining. So you cut that into three parts. You take the red square and you put it on the top uh, right-hand corner. And you still have two more parts remaining that you need to uh, use for the, to generate the third square. So you cut these two squares further into uh, four rectangles each. So you end up with eight rectangles. And uh, so the dimension of the small side of each rectangle will be one third times one fourth because you've con con you've cut the one third part in into four parts. Now you arrange four of these rectangles on this side, uh, and then another four. And so, as I said, the dimension is one third times one fourth of the small side of this rectangle. And uh, sorry, and then you en end up arranging the remaining four rectangles on the top. So you have this third square now, which has a dimension of one plus one third plus one third times one fourth. Now there's an extra area that is remaining that you need to subtract off. And that is, uh, was uh, this extra area, by subtracting off this extra area, I'm not going to go into details on how they did it, but it was quite simply done using some simple algebra. And uh, they were able to compute the area of that extra uh, little square and subtract it out from uh, uh, from the this number that they had computed, and that's how they got the accuracy of of uh, square root of two to the sixth decimal place. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, George G. E. Joseph, uh, a professor from uh, uh, University of uh, Manchester. He says some of the most impressive work in Indian and Chinese mathematics involve computations and visual demonstrations that were not formulated with reference to any formal deductive system. So uh, you can see uh, that it's quite true with some of this work that I just showed you now of how uh, inventive they were in trying to solve some very tough problems. They also had f some similar geometric methods for high order roots, such as cube roots. Uh, now, in contrast, the Greeks had uh, not quite figured out how to solve uh, square roots. Uh, there's an anecdote here in uh, it's called, it's referred to as the Delian problem of Greeks. So in 430 BC, in the city of Delos, the Greeks were facing a terrible plague. It was considered uh, that Apollo sent the plague, and the oracle suggested that Apollo would be pleased if a small cubic altar, uh, if the small cubic altar that was given to him was uh, doubled in size. 
uh, it's kind of curious that the Greeks were also making uh, offerings to their uh, gods in uh, geometric altars, geometrically shaped altars. Now the people double the length, the height and the breadth of the cube. So now when you, everybody who knows uh, basic uh, volume uh, uh, estimation of a cube, you know if you double that of uh, all the sides, you're going to end up making the area, the volume eight times higher than the original volume. So uh, the people, uh, the, Apollo was clearly not pleased and the plague continued. Uh, so this may be an anecdotal evidence, but it is in fact true that the ancient Greeks did not have solution for irrational numbers such as cube roots of two. It turns out uh, that there is some evidence that the Babylonians had a solution for these uh, numbers using an algorithm. Uh, but that still does, and it may have been, and in fact the Babylonians may, had a may have had a solution even earlier than the Indians. Uh, but it still doesn't take away from the fact that the Indians had come up with such innovative ways of solving problems. And mentioning these to school children is, uh, would only uh, help them to come up with such types of innovative solutions, or rather inspire them to come up with similar ways of, uh, of thinking and, uh, uh, and be able to solve problems. So I'm going to talk to you about now the contribution to algebra. You saw the incredible amount of work. I have in fact only touched upon some of the work that they did with geometry because of lack of time. Uh, I'd like to now highlight their uh, contribution to other fields such as algebra. Uh, the father of algebra actu is actually considered a Persian called Al-Khwarizmi from the 8th to the 13th century. He was heavily influenced by Indian math. He wrote a book, the book of addition and subtraction according to Hindu calculation. Uh, now, it turns out uh, Brahmagupta, much before al khwarizmi in the 6th century, made some significant contribution to algebra. Uh, it's known as Bijaganita in Sanskrit. He gave solutions to linear equations. If you recall, I, I had mentioned that Brahmagupta had also come up with negative numbers, and he had invented these negative numbers, and so he also explained that quadratic equations can have both positive and negative solutions. Uh, he also gave solutions to uh, uh, equations known as Pell, currently known as Pell equation, almost 1,000 years before him. Uh, a quick wrap up on contribution to trigonometry. Trigonometry is was highly developed in India because uh, trigonometry is used to solve problems in astronomy. Aryabhata, he had computed the value of pi to the fourth decimal place. Uh, the sine and cosine cosine tables known as Jia or Kotijia uh, were first given in the book Surya Siddhanta. Uh, now, it's kind of interesting as to how uh, Jia and Kotijia were transformed to sine and cosine in Latin, because that's how we learn it in, in, in our schools these days. So Jia refers to, a, in, in Sanskrit, refers to a bow, a bowstring. And you can see why it's called a bowstring, because when you inscribe a triangle in a circle, it resembles a bowstring. A koti is a base of a triangle, so you have the koti jia and uh, or kojia. So the jia became colloquially transformed to jia. And when the Ar Arabians uh, or the Arabs, uh, they were translating it, they actually made jia into jibba. So, and they had an acronym for Jibba known as Jib, J-B. So that was the acronym they had written down in, the, in their books. So when a lot of these Arabic texts were being translated uh, by the Europeans, and they didn't quite really understand what they were translating. translating. So Jibba became, uh, they thought Jib meant Jab. Jab means pocket in, uh, in Arabic. And so they started, directly translated it into sinus. Sinus means pocket or fold. And that's how you get the sine and the cosine. So these are known as translation howlers, um, because there were these translation, incorrect translations being made of these Hindu concepts. Now you have uh, Aryabhatiya in, uh, in Arya, Arab, Aryabhatta and Aryabhatiya who gave sign tables to the accuracy of the fourth decimal place, and Varamahira who further improved on these sign tables. Finally, I'd like to end with contribution uh, to modern calculus, uh, to modern mathematics, which is uh, calculus is modern mathematics. Indians contributed even to that. 
uh, Madhavacharya from the Skera School of Mathematics, he actually discovered many uh, infinite series uh, used in calculus almost 300 years before Newton and Leibniz. Newton and Leibniz were actually given, uh, are considered the discoverers of calculus. They were in fact fighting within each other that they were, that they were the one, that each one of them had discovered calculus before the other. But it turns out Madhavacharya had discovered these concepts way before either of them. He computed the value of pi to the accuracy of the 13th decimal place. Uh, he came up with uh, the sine series, which is attributed to Newton and Leibniz. He came up with the cosine series, which is also attributed to Newton and Leibniz. He came up with the arctangent and uh, series, uh, which uh, is considered a discovery of Gregory and Leibniz. And he also came up with the formula for pi, the series that computes the formula of pi uh, to the accuracy of the 13th decimal place. So. Uh, of course, now there, is, uh, there has been some, uh, uh, most of the math mathematicians uh, who are well established do know that Madhavacharya had contributed to all of this work way before L Newton and Leibniz. Uh, C.K. Raju, who is a famous mathematician uh, and physicist, who in his publication uh, actually showed uh, with some good substantial proof that Calculus had been transmitted to Europe through uh, Jesuit priests and uh, it reached the years of Newton and Leibniz who actually took some of his work and claimed it to be their own. Uh, you have uh, also George Joseph from the University of Manchester and Daniel Almeida from the University of Ex Exeter who uh, pretty much made similar claims. So I'm going to finally end with uh, traditional medicine. Uh, I'm going to, it's too vast a subject. I'm going to just give you a little snapshot of some of this very interesting work done by Shushruta. So there are uh, some basic tenets of Ayurveda. It's a complete medical system that takes into consideration the physical, the psych psychological, the philosophical, the ethical, and spiritual well-being of man. So it's a very holistic approach to uh, help uh, uh, a person who is ill. Uh, the universe is supposed to be consisting of five elements, earth, water, fire, air, space. And these are supposed to combine together to form what's known as the three doshas, uh, that, uh, uh, are, there's the, uh, uh, which are described as the pitta, vata, and kapha. The vata personality is supposed to be quick thinking and fast moving, the pitta, fiery, and the kapha, calm. So a person who has all of these doshas in balance uh, is usually considered a healthy person. But if there's an imbalance in, in these uh, uh, doshas, you could end up with disease. So Ayurveda believes there's a huge psychological component to the onset of disease and also to the treatment of disease, uh, which is very close to what modern medicine says now. Modern medicine actually uh, also agrees that there's the psychological element uh, for instance, stress can cause the onset of disease. So you can see Ayurveda, the concepts of Ayurveda are way ahead of, uh, uh, they, were, they were way ahead in their thinking. So you have classific, there are two main schools of Ayurveda. There's the Atriya Sampradaya, the school of physicians, and the Dhanvantri Sampradaya, which is the school of surgeons. Uh, Ayurveda is divided further into different types of specializations. Uh, there are some three key texts of Ayurveda, the Charaka Samhita, the Shushruta Samhita, and the Ashtanga Hridayam. Sh I'm going to focus on Shushruta, who is considered the father of surgery and plastic surgery. He was born in 7th century BC. He wrote the Shushruta Samhita. Is a statue of uh, the surgeon in uh, uh, dedicated uh, to the surgeon in the Royal Australia College of uh, Surgeons, Melbourne, Australia. Um, a, a quick quote from uh, on on Shishruta, who's considered, as I mentioned, the father of surgery. From he is, uh, the quote is from Frank McDowell, who's the editor of the Journal of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. He says, through all of Shushruta's flowery language, incantations, and irrelevancies, there shines the unmistakable picture of a great surgeon, undaunted by his failures, unimpressed by his successes. He sought the truth unceasingly and passed it on to those who followed. He attacked disease and deformity, deformity 
definitively which reasoned with reasoned and logical methods when the path did not exist he made one see he was a true pioneer and a genius here are some instruments that uh, he describes in the sushruta samhita he describes close to 121 surgical instruments uh, he was the first surgeon to classify and describe them in such detail many of them have faces of animals like the dog faced forceps the wolf faced forceps uh he describes the method of manufacture quality control maintenance and the specific usage in diagnosis and treatment of diseases he was the first one who came up with uh, uh endoscopes who described endoscopes both rectal oral nasal and vaginal specula uh, he has a quick text on the rectal speculum uh he talks about the kind of materials that you could use to make it uh the 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 dimensions of it for male patients and female patients he goes into a lot of detail in his book in his text there are almost close to 400 operations uh, he has uh, that surgeries that have been described in the shushrutha samhita some of these are cataract operations removal of urinary stones rhinoplasty which refers to plastic surgery of the nose lubeoplasty which is referring to plastic surgery of the ear lobes otoplasty which is plastic surgery of the outer ear now you would uh, he had all these detailed protocols on how to do these surgeries during uh, when you're doing surgery you have to also contend with uh, inf infection so he had come up with these fumigation or uh, protocols or dupanas as he called them to sterilize the room so for instance using fumes of mustard ghee salts or some of these examples that were used for the for dupanas um there were of course there are of course many many types of dupanas one can do uh, to disinfect he also uh, recommended anesthetics during surgery uh, using intoxicants such as wine and cannabis you can also end up with uh, uh, infection during the wound healing process so he had all these detailed protocols on how to help with wound healing using different types of medicated ghees and oils and these uh, are also kind of makes sense biochemically because many of these uh, uh oils have fatty acids which can help with uh, wound healing which are known to help with wound healing uh, a quick note on the rhinoplasty by shushruta i'm not going to go into the details of how he actually enter and how he would do these surgeries uh it, it was supposedly an ancient practice of cutting off the enemy's nose so to fix it he uh, he says that you should cut off you should cut a flap from the of the skin from the cheek of the person uh, who who you are doing surgery on and then without eliminate without really cutting off that flap you just turn it over the nose and then sort of uh, use it to mold and stitch and and then he gives all these details on how to go about uh, uh, with the wound uh, tying up the wound and then uh, wound uh, healing etc so it's interesting that uh, he recommended using the skin from the patient itself so they must have been aware that if you took skin grafts from other people your body would reject it as foreign so it was best to use tissue from the patient itself uh there was a indian uh, this no surgery was actually described in a gentleman's magazine in 1794 it was performed on a person called an indian person called kawas ji by an indian physician uh who had been mutilated by tupu sultan soldiers for collaborating with the british so this detailed surgery had been described in the magazine and this uh, this uh, british surgeon called joseph carpew in 1816 he reads this and follows this exact procedure which is inherited from shushruta and that results in a successful rhinoplasty surgery on an english patient Shushruta's ideas spread to many parts of the world uh, they were translated into arabic uh, there's a interesting story of bauer manuscript that was discovered in a buddhist stupa which is uh, in northwestern china uh, a, an englishman was traveling there and he was sold this manuscript which turns out to be a manuscript written in sanskrit which has a lot of ideas of charaka and shushruta this shows that many of these ideas this ma- the presence of this manuscript in this rather remote region of china suggests that ideas indian ideas had of shushruta had spread and other of other medical uh, 
practitioners from India had spread to different parts of the world. Uh, there were European translations uh, also done of his work. So I finally leave you with a slide on yoga, which is the gift of India to the world. As you can see how, how yoga has been transforming uh, as in uh, so many people's lives. Uh, it is an invaluable gift uh, of India's ancient tradition as uh, dedicated uh, by Narendra Modi to the, uh, at the United Nations General Assembly, uh, where he dedicated uh, June 2nd as the uh, June 21st, sorry, June 21st as the uh, International Day of Yoga. So uh, I hope uh, you've enjoyed this and I'm going to sign off now. I unfortunately don't have time to, I probably exceeded my time, I'll not be able to answer the questions, but I will look through the comments and make my, I'll read through the comments and make my comments. Thank you very much.